to the Caribbean Telecommunications Union Demystifying Cryptocurrencies and Digital Cash webinar. Bitcoin, as you know, uh, or as some of you may know, became legal tender in El Salvador. Bahamas here in the region launched the sand dollar as the world's first central bank digital currency, also known as CBDCs. And we've seen also in the media the market cap or mar market capitalization of stable coins surpassing 150 billion US dollars. With a multitude of new payment methods flooding the market, it is quite possible that members of the public, users, and other stakeholders may become confused since they're very different in terms of their usage, technologies, monetary policies, and also governance. But what exactly are these differences? What distinguishes these new currencies from existing e-money? What are the opportunities and risks of their introduction into the world and specifically our region? Which existing obstacles in the financial system do they tackle? Will they enhance financial inclusion of SMEs and citizens in the Caribbean? Or will they have an opposite effect? Can they help to foster the Caribbean single market and economy? Will they enhance financial inclusions of SMEs and citizens in the Caribbean? And most importantly, why should we even care about cryptocurrencies and digital cash? To answer these and many questions that you, our attendees, may have, our dynamic lineup of speakers will do just that. To start today's program, I would now like to introduce Mr. Rodney Taylor, Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Amit. You said everything I, I wanted to say, but um, thanks for joining us today. Welcome to all of our online participants, all 35 countries, uh, close to 500 participants, the CTU, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Um, We're pleased to host this webinar today, and we hope it will be a very engaging session. Now, to my right, I have uh, the good old fashioned greenback, and this is a $100 um, US dollar, 100 US dollars. And I can probably give it to the first person who guesses what this one is. Um, the only problem is that I'll have to post it to you because I'm not able to transfer it to you digitally. And of course, that's what we're talking about today. How do we digitize this? Um, well, it's actually a Barbados dollar as well, and an Eastern Caribbean uh, EC dollar. And what we're talking about today is what are the opportunities? We're talking a lot lately about digital transformation, about digital trade. Um, and the CTU has a responsibility to have a discussion and to raise public awareness about these issues and what the benefits are to the region. And, and this is why we're having this discussion today. And we hope that it will be a fruitful discussion. Um, we have a very distinguished panel lined up today. And unfortunately, I should say that uh, Minister Strawn, from the Honorable Minister Strawn, is not able to join us this morning uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances. But we also we have with us a very distinguished panel, which Amit will introduce, that will take us through what are the technical um, issues around digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, what are the differences when we talk about these things? Um, and more importantly, what are the opportunities for the region? In particular, with respect to trade, with respect to remittances, with respect to moving money across borders. And we hope to engage you and that we will have very fruitful discussions today. Um, and we will look at the issues impacting the region, in particular, uh, the regulatory issues, because we are aware that with respect to the use of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, um, there must be a, a sound regulatory environment. And from where we sit, we advise uh, our CARICOM member states with respect to technology and how they impact national and regional development. Uh, we are pleased to have the support of CARICOIN and ABED Ventures. Um, we are keen on hearing what they have to offer, what they have to say um, in terms of promoting and developing the CARICOM single market and economy through the use of digital currencies and through the facilitation of digital trade. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us and um, hand back over to Amit 
who will introduce the panel uh, for us for what, as I said, would hopefully be a very engaging discussion. Thank you very much, Amit. Thank you very much, um, Secretary General Taylor. And without further ado, uh, attendees, I'd like to introduce and invite Dr. Jan Schroeder, who will now start with his, um, his theme and his presentation, i.e. he will be explaining the new world of currencies from a conceptual perspective. Dr. Schroeder, over to you, sir. I mean, many thanks for introducing me and having me here. Uh, just give a short introduction of myself. I'm Chief System Architect of the CARP Dollar Project, which I'll describe a little bit later after giving a taxonomy on digital money. My background is being responsible for big societal change projects in Europe and Germany. So this is what I can bring to the table. I've been dealing with blockchain cryptocurrencies for over six years now and I'm happy to share what I've learned. We're still all learning, and that's why we need this kind of seminars. So let's just have a start. So as I said, I'd like to talk about digital payment means and really talk about everything which is out there. Uh, given overview, some kind of like a taxonomy of a user's perspective, so not do a very deep dive into tech, but give some kind of an overview and present a proposal for the Caribbean, how to use this, which we will certainly have to discuss afterwards. So what am I talking about when I talk about digital money? So this reads easily, digital money is any means of payment that exists in a purely electronic form, purely electronic. So what you were talking about, Rodney, electronic money, M money, these are representations of physical money. So essentially what's behind that is the physical money is a dollar bill. You can have the right to exchange such kind of digital, such kind of e-money into physical money. What I'm talking about in the talk is money, which is purely digital. It's not physically tangible. It doesn't inherit the right of receiving physical tangible dollar. You may exchange it somewhere, but there's no right attached, of it, uh, attached to it. So another thing, naturally, digital money is accounted for and transferred using online systems. So this for a def uh, first definition. So narrowing it down, taking away today's e-money, m-money, all that what you know in your classical bank account, this is not what I'm talking about. What I want to talk about is the different types of real digital money, purely digital money. So they all have common attributes, natural, they're fast, they're fairly easily accessible. There are even a lot of offline solutions nowadays, so you don't have to be online all the time. So these are common attributes of digital money. But there's some and very important differentiators. And these are three, I would say. It's a safety, it's issuance, it's stability. Maybe we'll touch sustainability as well during the discussion, but I'd like to focus on these three because they're inherent concerning the value of digital money. So if you try to build up something like a systematic around these three attributes, then stability may come from different points. Stability may come from assets which are behind such a digital money. So take, for example, in the good old past, you had the gold standard. So there was gold behind each dollar note. We don't have that anymore. Nowadays, all our so-called fiat uh, <clears throat> currencies are less based on good faith. We trust governments, we trust central banks, and this gives it value amongst all the use cases. And there's a third one discussed a lot, can we do it in an algorithmic way? So somehow balance demand <clears throat> and supply to make the digital money stable. The second category, issuance. So what are we talking about? Who issues something like that? Facebook made a big move three years ago to do a private stable coin. So this would have been a completely private issue. By the way, they stopped that. Public issues like central banks are very well known. And the third thing coming around with blockchain, distributed ledger technology are so-called protocols. So there's no legal entity behind that. There's a set of code and rules, quasi printing, generating digital money, 
just following these rules. And so nobody can really infer with that anymore. So these are the three types of issuance we can see. Coming to safety, somewhere if you have digital money, the information has to be stored. So there are two ways you can do that. You can do it in a classical database. You have it centralized. So there's all the information, how much money you have in your account. And you really, really have to safeguard that, build a huge vault, a digital vault around that so nobody can get in there. The other way of doing it is using distributed ledger technologies. So just imagine you have a copy of a copy of a copy, you have X hundreds of copies of this ledger. This makes this much more difficult to change these data. On the other side, you have to have algorithms which take, well, make sure that all these copies are the same. There's a lot of work being done there in cryptography to even make the data you have on these technologies even safer. Then concerning safety, do you have one central authority being in responsibility for the data? This may be a way of doing it very safe if this is a highly trusted authority. Or you do it the other way. You say, let's rather decentralize responsibility, spread it among a lot of entities. This makes things secure because you don't have one single point of attack. So now let's look into how do these different forms types of digital currency, digital money may be sorted into this. So I'll just start with the CBDCs you already mentioned, Amit, central bank digital currencies. So they're essentially the digital pendant to what we have today as cash. So it's a purely digital money issued by a central bank, and it's mostly based on good faith, like the money from central banks is. So issuance is an easy topic in this case. They're publicly issued, publicly issued. But if we look into the reality, we have very different technological background. The, the Jamaican <clears throat> CBDC works on a central database. Dcash is decentralized, uh, is on a distributed ledger technology. But both are somehow centralized because there's one entity behind it. Looking at the extreme Bitcoin, well, it ain't stable at all. It has a high volatility, so it doesn't really fit into digital money because who would like to wake up with his digital money just having half of the worth it had in the evening before? Things like this may happen. Nevertheless, let's look at Bitcoin a little bit more. It's issued by a protocol, so there's no entity printing money. It's a protocol which is designed to have a deflationary supply of Bitcoin and a deflationary rise of the supply of Bitcoin. It is purely decentralized, so there's nobody, no central entity in responsibility, and it's using blockchain distributed ledger technology. Now let's look at stable coins, things coming from the cryptocurrency side. So Tether is one of the biggest. They claim it's backed by assets by the US dollar, there's a lot of rumor that this may not be 100% true. So maybe there's some faith in there as well, looking at this kind of asset. Nevertheless, it has been rather stable over the last years. It's completely privately issued. It's centralized because it's issued by one company, but it's distributed ledger technology. So it's a blockchain, let's say, like that behind there. And if you go even deeper, so-called stable coins, which are cryptographic digital money claiming they have a stable value, use a lot of different forms to provide stability. Some are asset-backed, use gold. Others use other cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Others are merely algorithmic. And there are a lot of things in between as well. So there's a lot of things being yeah, discovered at the moment in this field. They mostly are issued either privately or through protocols. Normally, no public instant entities <clears throat> in the game. And they use very different um, sceneries. Some are centralized, some are decentralized. Most of them use distributed ledger technology. So this is to give you a first overview of what we're talking about. So there are a lot of different things. If you look for stability, then you have to look Carefully, what's behind that? Is it assets? Is it just good faith? Is it algorithmic? Each of them have specific risks. If you look at faith, 
Look at Venezuela, this didn't work there. Look at algorithmic stable coins. We just had a big crash in the market in the last weeks. Look at asset-based things. This didn't work in the 70s. But on the other side, you find very well working digital money in all these fields as well. USD is stable. Rabat, Beijing dollar, who's linked to USD, is stable, <clears throat> etc. So how can we utilize this for the Caribbean? Just have a short look at the state of play. We have a disconnected Caribbean struggling to establish a single market and economy since 50 years. We have a lot of restrictions on capital mobility, so a lack of liquidity due to the dependency on the US dollar, correspondent banks getting going out of the region because of risk mitigation, so-called risk mitigation. And on the other side, there are some internal problems, the lack of institutional integrations within CARICOM, and it's really tough to set up a Caribbean single market economy. You need a lot of resources and capacity. I'm coming from Europe and we're putting lots of efforts into make the EU run. It's still far from an ideal case. So there's an opportunity using digital money. Let's think about creating a pan-Caribbean digital money. So if you want to buy pineapples as a grocer in Barbados from Jamaica, you just use this currency. You don't have to exchange to USD and from Barbadian dollar to, and then back into the Jamaican dollar. Just use this one digital money across the Caribbean. Wouldn't that be great? It would deliver seamless, fast and cheap payments, it would provide liquidity, and then open a fast track towards CSME without a need to replace the national currencies, which really is a hassle if you want to go that way. So this is exactly what we want to propose, Carib dollar, an easy to use digital money with a stable value. Stability mostly comes from backing it by Caribbean collaterals, and it should be governed by a consent of Caribbean public and private stakeholders. We'd like to call it a Caribbean stakeholders' digital money, so a CSDM, new abbreviation in the game. So where does this fit into this competitive analysis? It's mostly asset-backed. There's some good faith in there as well, because if Caribbean stakeholders essentially take care of the governance, and this could be central banks, this could be institutions like CTU, this could be private companies having an interest in a economically stable Caribbean, this would be give press stability. Issuance would be a mix of public and private. And we propose using distributed ledger technology for sakes of safety. And it's something between centralized and decentralized because it's not one entity responsible for this digital money. So we're not just talking, we're building it. June 17th, we'll have a workshop with businesses to design the trade finance applications for this. This year, we'll create an MVP with these solutions for trade finance and launch within two countries, Barbados and Jamaica, within six months from now. This is our plan to set this up. I'd like to invite you to join us in a workshop. Just scan this and you'll get to <clears throat> the possibility to engage. We'll discuss features of CARIB dollar, develop app requirements, and design the pathway for the MVP. Who's behind this? This is Abbott Ventures, Caribbean-based technology accelerator, and myself as chief systems architect. And now I'm happy and open for any discussion concerning the taxonomy of digital money and our proposal. Many thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Jan, for that informative presentation. Um, I think right off the bat, Carib coin could be a solution to the problem that um, Secretary General Taylor mentioned earlier when he wanted to transfer that um, 100 US dollar. Um, Secretary General, if we had Carib coin or something of that up and running, I'd be happy to receive that $100 US. Um, I think it's, I. I yeah, Dr. Schroeder, if I may ask for, for the attendees here, what is the website address for, for those on today's conference for them to go and learn more? Um, and if there are any white papers there that they can download and review, what is what is your website address for the project? Yeah, uh, www.carcoin.com. Great. And there's a white paper you can download. 
Perfect. Um, attendees, uh, panelists, before we started, we kicked off with a poll wherein we asked pretty much um, attendees and participants whether or not they believed um, in terms of a yes or no question, would crypto and digital cash replace um, paper money or analog money, if we're gonna say digital money or digital cash, um, if these will be replaced by crypto in 10 years uh, based on the results so far, um, over 65% of participants in the poll believe it will. Um, uh, 30 odd percent believe it won't. Um, we actually have uh, a question, if I may, Dr. Schroeder. Um, we have a question coming in from Facebook. How much or what percentage of a person's assets do you recommend to be in digital money? So I think this is more of a, uh, an investment type question. Uh, Dr. Schroeder, what are your, I, I know investment advice can be kind of tricky because it all depends <laughs> on a person's appetite for risk and, and whatnot and, and what they have available to invest. But what, what do you think, um, Dr. Schroeder, in relation to that question? So as I pointed out, digital, most of digital money is no investment case. It's a use case. It's money with a stable value. And this was actually what I was talking about. This is stable coins, CBDCs, carib dollar. All of these have a stable value. And I put Bitcoin outside of this definition of digital money because essentially it is no digital money in this case. It's no store of value which you could use in an everyday use case. Even if El Salvador uses this at this, they have severe difficulties, by the way, in doing so. So I think every business should have a lot of digital money because it just enhances trade and makes things just easier. And the more merchants use digital money, the more you should have in your wallet and on your account. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question, um, um, Dr. Shorter, if I may. Um, we have a query uh, as, as it relates to Carib Coin. What assets or what mixture of assets will be used to back Carib Coin? Yeah, thank you for that question. We have been doing a lot of thinking about that. So during the MVP, the first step we'll do is we'll use Caribbean currencies like the Beijing dollar, Jamaican dollar, Trini dollar, whatever. Uh, second step, we'll go and use already digitized assets. This may be gold, oil, gas, whatever. And third step is we'll have to, we, we may put back uh, in the assets things like honey, things like limestone. So really making the issuer, this public right issuer of Carib coin, a vendor in the region, really buying regional assets and using them as a backup for these assets. We are very well aware that we need some kind of li very liquid assets, but we can have other assets as well. The more stable the whole thing comes, the more use cases there are. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and again, this is obviously quite a, you know quite a, a topic that's on everyone's mind. You know, we have another question right here. Why should the Caribbean create their own digital token? if other highly liquid decentralized alternatives exist? In other words, why reinvent the wheel? Why, you mm -hmm. know, why, why start all over? No, we don't start all over. The alternatives we have are all dependent on the USD. So this is, would just be copying the same dependency of the Caribbean economies on the US dollar by using an asset which is, well, more liquid, which is the only difference. We propose something different. We propose having it backed by Caribbean assets. We propose having a peg defined by Caribbean stakeholders. So maybe a Caribbean inflation should be different from the USD inflation, just in, in macroeconomic terms. And this is something which should be decided in the Caribbean and not by the Fed in Washington and other people just copying the inflation rate and the monetary policy of the Fed. So, so kind of like we maintain control of our own destiny within the region from a policy point of view, governance point of view, and also from a technical point of view. Um, we have another interesting question here. 
um, would the value of carb coin fluctuate like Bitcoin or do you see it being pegged in some form or fashion? It would definitely not float like Bitcoin. This wouldn't make sense. Then it would not be a stable digital money. So no, we would have to define a peg in the Caribbean, say could be one USD for the start because everybody's used to it or two or 2.7, whatever you like. But this peg could change over time and you just define the way how it changes. Maybe this is already leading towards the panel because I think there are Caribbean economists in there and they have much more insight in the Caribbean economy than I have. <laughs> okay. Um, we have, um, we have a, an interesting question from the perspective of um, from cybersecurity and privacy. Um, in the news also, there have been a lot of reports about exchanges being hacked, uh, wallets being compromised, even central bank digital currencies um, being used to completely um, snoop on, on CBDC holders. That's especially something that's, that's on, the, on the minds of some European um, central bankers. How, how do we, how does the region, and especially looking at, looking at Carib coin for argument's sake, how, how do we reduce the risks and ensure, you know, from a privacy perspective, you know, once everybody starts using um, a Carib coin or a CBDC, you know, privacy kind of diminishes relative to traditional um, paper notes and, and, and coinage, so to speak. And, and also, along with privacy, we have the issues of cybersecurity with infrastructure being attacked um, and whatnot. What happens when the lights go? Will I still be able to go to, to the shop you know, to, to buy something to eat or something to drink? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, now th this is a ton of questions. <laughs> so first thing concerning privacy, um, if you go into the internet, there are two possibilities you have. You can say every time you use the same IP address and then you're traceable, or every time you go in there, that's the way we do it year round is you get a new address. So you're by far not as traceable. You can do the same when you have a digital wallet and use it every time for the network, you have your own new address. So that's one way of ensuring that people can't look into your wallet and no company would like to have others looking into their wallet and we're very well aware of that the other thing you have been talking about i think is safety against electricity cutdowns so there's a lot of work being done at the moment to have all these wallets working offline as well to some extent so it's always a small trade-off between security and uh, availability um, but there are solutions being thought of. We're well aware of that as well. And concerning the attack vectors, I personally think decentralized forms of storage, so distributed ledger technology, has a high advantage against centralized things. Because when you talk about attacks in cryptocurrency, it's most of the exchanges. It's central exchanges which are attacked. It's not the currency and the network itself. So it's just those guys using central databases are not protecting them in a, a good way. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Schroeder. Um, I am cognizant of time. Uh, I'd like to remind um, participants that uh, we will continue to answer questions um, following the presentations and the discussions. With that being said, uh, I'd... Um, Dr. Schroeder, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now move on to our panel discussion. Um, the first part of the presentation uh, with Dr. Schroeder looked at it from one perspective. This perspective will now look at it from uh, an examination of the economic and social opportunities for different stakeholders. Uh, and with us today, we have a very esteemed set of um, panelists. We have Ms. Sharman Powell, uh, the chair of the FinTech Group of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. She'll present on the regulatory perspective on digital currencies. We also have Ms. Marla Dukaran, also known as uh, the Caribbean's rock star economist. Uh, she will be speaking uh, on the use case driving central bank digital currency adoption in the region. And finally, we have Ms. Vashti Maharaj, 
Last year as an advisor, digital trade policy at Trade Oceans and Natural Resources Directorate that sits within the Commonwealth Secretariat. She will be presenting on the role of cryptocurrency and digital cash in building the digital economy. As, um, as we mentioned before, full biographies of all speakers today can be viewed on the CTU's website at www.cpu.int forward slash events. I'd like to kick off by inviting Ms. Powell to present. Um, she'll then be followed by Ms. Dugran and finally Ms. Maharaj. Uh, Ms. Powell, over to you. Hi, good morning. And good morning to everyone who has joined this very interesting webinar this morning. And this morning, I would briefly just touch on the regulatory perspective as it relates to digital currencies. As most of you would know, that we have recently launched our Dcash, which is our central bank digital currency. But before going into that briefly, I just want to highlight um, where we stand in terms of cryptocurrencies, as it were. So we do recognize at the ECCB that we have a responsibility to um, influence the adoption of and the speed and the extent of the disruption as it relates to fintech innovation in the ECCU. And we do recognize as well that fintech developments can present opportunities for the region. Mm -hmm. However, there are some attendant risks that we must be borne in mind when we are um, exploring the potential benefits. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done to date in the absence of any real regulation within the ECCU that speaks to these cryptocurrencies, we have done media releases on fintech operations and basically advising citizens to be cautious in their involvement in related to cryptocurrency or crypto assets. But, but at the same time, we have recognized that there is a need to um, create the enabling environment for these fintech corporations, given where we are moving with digital currencies. And so we are in the process of reviewing our payment system legislation. And that legislation basically is, that, that review is basically to create um, that enabling environment for fintech startups, because we recognize the legislation as it is, when it was done, there were no fintech companies per se on the horizon. And so for fintech companies in the region to operate now, it is somewhat difficult because um, the regulation and legislation that are currently there and are conducive to those type of operations. So we are reviewing the, the legislation, the payment system legislation to make it um, somewhat more conducive for these fintech startups. However, we are bearing in mind the risk associated with this. And so we're working closely with the local regulators as well in terms of how we can get that balance between the safety for our citizens who we want to invest in these instruments or use these instruments and in terms of the legislation that for, for the regulation of, the, of these um, currencies. Now, in response to the whole digital space and digital currencies, though, the EC would have launched its Dcash in March of 2021, and Dcash is basically the digital version of our EC currency. And what it does provides the convenience of digital payments alongside the comfort of traditional money. So what we have basically given the best of both worlds. So persons can um, use Dcash to make payments. It's a payment instrument. It's a payment option. And so you can, you can now um, use the Dcash to engage in digital payments, but you have that comfort of knowing that it's fully backed by the ECB reserve, same as the physical currency, and the comforts that are associated with traditional money, you have that comfort remaining with Dcash. And one of the key objectives as well out of the whole um, Dcash solution is to promote financial inclusion. Because we do recognize that despite the fact that we've made significant strides in the region as it relates to um, financial services, there are some persons who are still financially excluded as it relates to digital payments. So they don't have the ability to participate in financial in digital payments because of the fact that they don't have the instruments. So they may not be able to get a debit card or a credit card. And so the Dcash is meant to provide that option to persons who are otherwise financially excluded. So they can now participate in transactions such as online payments and other forms of digital payments that they would not otherwise be able to participate in. So that's one of our main objectives of the Dcash project in terms of promoting financial inclusion and, and, and an enabling environment for persons who would not otherwise be able to participate in that digital transaction. It also allows for improved financial management, given that persons are now being able to 
while participating in digital payments, they are able to now um, track their, their expenses, which is something that you can't do with physical cash. It's, it's more difficult, not that you can't do it, it's more difficult to track expenses in physical cash. And so therefore, we are now um, promoting Dcash as a means of improving financial management, not only for individuals, but also for some of the persons who are in the informal sector, where we have persons there who may have a thriving business, but, for, but the absence of proper financial records to show what their, their earnings and their expenses are, they're not able to really um, highlight the success of their businesses. And so that improved financial management aspect of Dcash is very important. And overall, it creates greater payment system efficiency. Uh, persons, financial institutions in particular, will have less dealing with um, physical cash. I mean, the cost and the operational um, procedures associated with physical cash. And so there is greater overall efficiency in the payment system, both from the side, the view of the commercial banks and other financial institutions, as well as the, the general public merchants and users. So from a, a regulator perspective, we do recognize the importance of digital currencies as we go forward. It is important, but we have to balance that, um, that thrust towards digital payments with the whole safety and security. And so, we are we are open to an inclusion. However, we have to ensure that the, the regulatory um, framework is in place to properly manage these innovations. And we also recognize it's a public-private sector partnership. So there are some aspects of it. For example, the online infrastructure. Most of the digital currency solutions rely on electricity and um, data. Or, or some of other form of, of internet connectivity. So therefore, it will, will require that, that private public sector partnership for it to be successful. So from a regulator perspective, we have to work with all the various stakeholders in the ecosystem to make sure that at the end of the day, when we actually um, promote these solutions, that we have the underlying legislative framework and also the underlying infrastructure supports it, so that it can be easy, not only easily used, but it can be reliant. Um, in the public sphere. So that is generally what we want to highlight from a regulatory perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Paul, for that. Um, very, very interesting what the Eastern Caribbean is doing in, in that space. Um, I would like to now invite Ms. Marla Legrand, um, who will speak on the use cases driving CBDC adoption in the region. Uh, Ms. Dukaran. Hi, yes, good morning. Thank you everyone. Um, and thanks to the CTU for having me. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight, you know, my thoughts around what I'm seeing happening in the region and why. When you initially talked about um, Secretary General, the fact that um, and Amit as well, the fact that, you know, recently El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as their legal tender, which means that by law within the borders of El Salvador, you are obligated to accept Bitcoin as settlement for any obligation that somebody wishes to, to settle with you. Um, when you look at that happening, and you, you have to ask yourself why. And the reason why is because there are use cases that are not satisfied with the, with the current banking um, sector's services or credit union services. There are uses, use cases that are un, being unmet. There are needs that are being unmet um, by the existing financial sector institutions. And one of the most important for El Salvador is remittances. Um, remittance channels are known um, across the world to be very expensive. You have those that run from, you know, two or three percent of the cost of the transaction all the way up to twenty five percent of the cost of sorry of the of the size of the transaction. And remember that remittances are a channel of sending and receiving funds that is used by some of the poorest people on the planet. So when you think about the poorest people on the planet paying sometimes as much as 20 or 25% of the money that they're sending in, in fees, it's, it's a huge injustice. 
Okay, so that's one of the main reasons that um, El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as their legal tender. And when you look around the region and the Secretary General, as well as, as Jan talked about the whole cross-border um, settlement problem, that's another reason why Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies exist and have proliferated. Because first of all, in order to send money cross-border, you have to be, if you to send a wire transfer, you have to be banked. So you have to be financially included. El Salvador, for example, has a high level of financial exclusion, but in the Caribbean, in varying numbers or percentages, we also have a financial inclusion problem in this region. There are some countries where there is a high level of financial inclusion in excess of 75%. So Barbados is a good example, especially if you count credit unions, it's almost, it's closer to 100%. Um, the Cayman Islands is another good example. But then you have countries like Haiti, um, Dominican Republic, Suriname, Guyana, even Jamaica, where you have financial inclusion levels that are much lower, in some cases, 20, 30 percent. So these people have no access to banking and they have no access to remittance um, uh, channels that are, that are efficient and easy to use. They rely on Western Union and so on. Um, money transfer agencies, and then they don't have access to cross-border the way that um, those who are financially included do via wire transfer. So you, you have this challenge, this use case that's not satisfied, these two, um, um, and we talked a lot about um, cross-border and trade settlement. And these are very, very important use cases for us in the region because we are highly open economies. And by that, I mean, that when you look at the proportion of GDP of exports and imports, in most countries in the region, exports plus imports is actually greater than your GDP, okay? In, in many countries in this region. So that tells you the extent to which we are dependent on trade. And even though we are so dependent on trade, we do not have robust and, and, and efficient um, trade settlement infrastructure in place, except for the wire transfer, the whole SWIFT um, system. And as the Secretary General mentioned earlier, and Jan as well, when you have um, de-risking, which we won't get into the reasons for de-risking because it's a, it's a complex issue, um, when you have a, a de-risking taking place, uh, most famously in, in Belize, where they actually at one point in time had zero um, uh, correspondent banking relationships, even the central bank. Um, so they could not send and receive money um, across borders. This de-risking means that our, as a nation, our our ability to, to settle cross-border transactions is inhibited. So all of these issues conflate to drive us to find solutions that the banks are not providing. And on the issue of banks, remember that the largest banks in this region are Canadian banks, mostly. They are not banks that, um, I mean, you have some what I would call indigenous banks in Trinidad and Jamaica that have um, regional presence. So you have like JMMB, you have Republic Bank, the Citizens Bank. But the largest banks that dominated the space, the banking space for many, many years are Canadian banks. And Canadian banks do not have the kind of development lens that we require in this region for a bank to have, where you think about the challenges as a developing country, as a developing region, and issues like um, financial inclusion, they're not equipped to deal with these things. They're not even motivated to deal with these things. So, so we have a, a gap. I mean, there are some indigenous banks. I think JMMB does a fantastic job of reaching people that I suppose the larger banks do not want to bank and the, certainly the Canadian banks. And 
providing the solutions for them. But none of the banks have provided effective cross-border um, settlement solutions. So I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, um, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez was wanted to take Trinidad to task, I think at the, at the CARICOM level, because when vegetable and fruit traders from St. Vincent came to Trinidad to, to sell their products, and basically that's an export from, from St. Vincent. At one point in time, they used to be paid with US dollars. And then, you know, because of poor policy in Trinidad and Tobago, then there's tightness for US currency. So then they get paid in EC dollars. And that's fine. That's their local currency. And then because you have to get US dollars to buy EC dollars and US dollars are tight in Trinidad, then these, um, these exporters, um, hucksters as they're called in the EC, were starting to be paid in TT dollars. And what would they do with TT dollars? Well, they would have to buy goods in Trinidad and take it back to the EC to then sell those goods, to then pay the farmers for the goods that the farmers gave to them. And so Dr. Gonzalez said, you know, this is not fair and this is not working. But the crux of the problem was not the fact that Trinidad had tightness in their foreign currency or the fact that the people, the, the, the merchants buying the goods didn't have the money to pay. It was the lack of a cross-border settlement solution. Now, Dr. Jan went through a lot of um, explanation about Carib coin and, um, you know, the fact remains that we need a solution. Since the 1970s, we had the um, Cari Forum um, uh, settlement, settlement transaction. I can't remember what it's called. Multilateral clearing facility, sorry. The multilateral clearing facility where the Cari CARICOM members states were able to trade with each other. And basically they had a structure where they had a, a line of credit with each other. So I'm sending you goods and you just write it down in, in your ledger as to the fact that you owe me this money and I write it and we, at the end of a particular period, you're supposed to pay me back. But that meant that we, in, we incur credit risk for each other. And then when Guyana defaulted, everything fell apart. So that mechanism where you take on credit risk of your trading partners is not the best solution. There is a solution that's live today where central banks, um, Trinidad and Barbados, for example, but they're not the only ones, have a cross-border settlement solution between themselves where they basically have a nostro vostro account with each other. So I'm sending you, um, I'm supposed to send you money and you're supposed to send me money. We enter it into our ledger basically. And at some point in time, we're netting off what we owe to each other. But again, this is somewhat based on a credit, um, a, a, a credit system. Um, so that also has risks. When, when, whenever you're taking on credit or giving credit, there are risks, credit risk associated with that, as opposed to just a settlement that settles one time. It's just settlement risk that you have and maybe some operational risk. Um, so anyway, so getting back to the whole point about the use cases. So we have the remittance channel. We have the cross-border um, and trade settlement use case that is not yet satisfied. Of course, in the Eastern Caribbean with their decash, they now can move money across islands without going to the bank and waiting what used to take days and in the same currency. So it's like moving money from one end of Jamaica to the other. If you, if you think about it just in terms of the distance and moving from one island to the other used to take days, it's, it's sort of absurd that this is what the banks used to do years ago. Um, so now with their digital currency, they no longer, in, at least technically, they, they have the capacity to, to settle in seconds from one country to the other using, um, using your digital currency or decash. And that's actually the optimal solution that everybody wants all over the world, which is why cryptocurrencies exist. Now, the question then arises about... Um, how do you best solve these, these use cases, these problems, these demands without putting yourself at more risk? When you 
use you hold and use bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency that varies in value you're putting your 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 capital at risk a cbdc which is issued by the same issuer as the money you have in your pocket the secretary general was waving a note earlier um it's the same trust that you place in that note that you would place in the digital currency once you satisfy as shaman um outline once you satisfy um cybersecurity and privacy issues so we already have the capacity with a cbdc to allow for this transaction um settlement within borders in in terms of the cross border solution of course carib coin sounds technically like an idea that could could work but then you have the issue of conversion you have the issue of onboarding or forwarding um my own personal view is that the central banks of this region need to come together and this is something that was discussed widely at the caribbean settlement network we haven't met in a while and we haven't really been able to convince caricom to take this on it's it was submitted to caricom and it was taken on by the economic commission as one of the initiatives that caric the csme is is going to focus on then came the pandemic um but this is something that caricom is committed to exploring and i feel personally that the 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 safest solution is for different countries to issue their own cbdc and then we have a settlement mechanism between each of the cbdcs and there's interoperability between the networks and you connect all of the cbdcs and each um transaction is settled by a conversion using um smart contracts around the conversion of the currencies into one into the other you can use the us dollar benchmark because that's where we are now but that doesn't mean you have to convert to us dollars you just use it as a benchmark to value the currency at the point of the transaction and you have you know a solution there um i think that without a cross border settlement solution in this region we will continue to see um problems like i I'm outlined earlier that um that dr gonzalves raised we will continue to see our intra regional trade be dwarfed by our extra regional trade we will continue to see the food and fuel security that we're trying to build stymied by the fact that we cannot trade effectively with with each other outside of the use of us dollars ideally you would want a farmer in guyana or in st vincent to be able to put his goods on a boat to send to barbados or to trinidad and say to his merchant to his to his client um i've just put the 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 um goods on the boat this is the cost and and on his mobile phone he receives payment in his currency digitally in in without the the um client on the other end having to go to the bank the uh, client on the other end will open his digital currency app let's say it's guyanese dollars and send the equivalent of guyanese dollars and it will be converted and land in ec dollars on the other side let's just say that's ideally how i think it should work and i think it can work the central banks have to agree and the digital currencies have to be their networks have to be connected and there has to be some work around driving that interoperability and connectivity but i think ideally that's that's that is the solution i think that would really transform this region thank you thank you marlon very much for those those very interesting and, and very real world and practical use cases uh i myself having spent some time living and working in trinidad has some challenges remitting um money back to my home country in barbados so it'll be very interesting to see how this all plays out what what i'm hearing um you know from what you're saying from what um miss paul was saying and and dr shorter was saying also in some cases i think uh, it may not be so much of a technological problem as it is um potentially a legislative cultural bureaucratic um, <laughs> yes 
that problem as well. Bureaucratic problem, yes. So, um, so with that being said, uh, I, I I thank you for that. I'd like to remind to remind attendees we have some excellent questions coming in. Um, do keep them coming in. We're going to get to them um, as soon as we finish our panelist presentation. Uh, we also have a second poll, which is operational um, for attendees to have a look at. At this point in time, I'd like to um, invite our next panelist, uh, um, Ms. Bashti Maharaj. She will be um, talking about the role of cryptocurrency and digital cash in building the, the digital um, economy. Uh, Ms. Maharaj, um, welcome to the panel. Um, you have the floor. Thank you, Amit. And I'd also like to thank Mala and Shamin for their excellent overview and presentations. Um, and it actually leads beautifully into the topic which I'll be covering, which is the role of cryptocurrency and digital currencies in building the digital economy within the Caribbean. And um, Mala, you, you put it very well um, in terms of our Caribbean issue that we're facing and the need for greater integration. So without more, um, and I'd be very remiss if I, if I did not start by putting a little bit of context into what we do and the role that we play with regard to supporting the Caribbean. The Commonwealth Connectivity Agenda um, was adopted by Commonwealth leaders in 2018, and it aims to boost trade and investment across the Commonwealth by raising intra-Commonwealth trade. And I focus on the digital connectivity portfolio which focuses on digital transformation and building the digital economy that is currently being co-led by South Africa and the UK. So let's look at the big picture here. In terms of digital trade, we're looking at the movement of goods and products using digital means in terms of platforms and ICT, which serves as a backbone for digital trade, providing the necessary network infrastructure. Underpinning digital trade is the movement of data. And at its core, there are a host and suite of digital solutions that we look at to integrate to allow for the optimization of our trade process flows, cloud computing, the internet of things, AI, big data, et cetera. And where digital currencies come into play is that it can be a real game changer by allowing for persons to now not only trade their goods, online, but be able to send and receive payment online. Within the Caribbean, you will find that there, there are solutions that do exist. And in not just cryptocurrencies, which people do, businesses do use cryptocurrencies because of the fact that we've had a lot of trade disruptions, we've had forex restrictions, and there needed to be payments that are made um, by suppliers and purchasers in order to get intra and extra regional trade boosted and promoted. But even within the Caribbean, you'd find that as a region, we are strong, but very volatile in terms of our economic systems. When you look at Bahamas, there was the whole thrust towards launching the sand dollar because of the incidents of natural disasters. This is also the case of Haiti, where you have a lot of consecutive natural disasters and it had allowed them and it gave them the impetus to look at launching the digital wallet and the widespread use of mon cash. We also have within other jurisdictions definite effects that have been happening um, within our economies by the effect of the global pandemic where you find that a lot of businesses have been negatively affected by quarantines, lockdowns, social distancing, export restrictions that have had tremendous impacts on their supply chains. And even recently, global disruptions in the supply chain arising out of the Ukraine crisis or any other major disruption has demonstrated the need to make payment systems within the region more resilient against shocks. So you find that within the Caribbean itself, we have been negatively impacted by certain global disruptions. And you find that more so now than ever, businesses are being motivated to embrace the use of digital currencies and governments are more so being motivated 
to resort to the use of CBDCs because they understand the dynamic impact and transformational impact that it can make, not just in the global economy from a holistic perspective, but we do have within the Caribbean our particularities where we have a large informal economy that when you have the closure of banks and the inability to even access financial services, the persons who are being hardest hit are the SMEs and the MSMEs that are really unbanked and underbanked. And as a result of this, you find that the increased use of digital financial services has in fact received as a lifeline for many businesses in order to thrive and survive. So in looking at this, you will find that post COVID, the biggest opportunities are in fact digital. Digital transformation, new opportunities, creating new products, and rethinking your supply chain and building resilience. And that is one of the things that I'd like to, you know, take away from what the previous speaker, Marla, has really put a lot of emphasis on. They need to really build resilience, but also enhance Caribbean integration. So what are the economic opportunities that are presented, and particularly so within the Caribbean? It fosters dynamism of entrepreneurial activity because you find that the real persons or the real businesses that are more inclined towards using cryptocurrencies represent more cutting edge clientele that value transparency in their transactions. It also enables the firms, notably the smaller ones, to be able to use new and innovative tools to overcome barriers to growth. It allows for new business models that gives access to bigger markets. And you will find that when you break it down to the brass tax of dollars and cents, transactions that are carried out directly between different owners of electronic wallets help to increase the speed of transaction and actually reduce fees because you cut out the middleman. You would, however, find, as Charmaine has pointed out, that in looking at this paradigm shift, Governments, therefore, face new regulatory challenges because there is a balance to be struck in ensuring that the opportunities are balanced and the benefits with mitigating against the risks and challenges that arise. So I'm not going to go too much into the central bank digital currency because I know that Charmaine has done an excellent job in pointing out the achievements made by Dcash. And I know that we have already looked at the potentiality of CaribCoin, but I think I really want to place emphasis on some of the challenges that we are facing to market adoption within the Caribbean. While from an economic perspective, and even for technocrats and technologists, it's common sense. The potentialities that come from embracing the use of CBDCs and digital currencies, and it's natural merging with the shift to virtual platforms to trade and investment. But the truth about it is that technology and solutions are always going to be there. It is really what lags are two things. The digital financial literacy to be able to fulsomely embrace the technology and also as it would happen, not just in the Caribbean, but all over the world, the regulatory infrastructure to allow for it to actually thrive and prosper in the way that it can to enhance the economy. So within the Caribbean, there's generally a lack of awareness and trust in the potential of e-commerce and a cultural aversion to the use of technology. Wearing my former hat, which is a public sector one, you find that it is not an aversion to technology, but an aversion to change. People tend to cleave to the things that they know that they're accustomed to, to their routines, to their habits. Even looking at the transformational effects, for example, as a remittance economy region, with many of us being second and generation burial children, the fact of the matter is that our grandparents, great grandparents, and even I can tell you peers, feel comfortable having a bank book. They feel comfortable in dealing with an in-person transaction and seeing a face behind that, that counter. So they are assured and they're confident that no one will take their money away and there's an avenue for redress. 
There's also an absence of broadband infrastructure coupled with high cost of internet and digital devices. You will find that within the last 10 years, five to 10 years, this has not been as much of a challenge because of the fact that the, the Caribbean has a very high level of internet penetration. But it does not mean that there's absolute universal service. And you find that the, the small businesses and the parts of the informal economy that really can stand to benefit from the use of digital currencies are tend to be the outliers. They're not going to be based in your capital cities. They're going to be based in regions and areas that are underserved, and it's important to ensure that there's adequate physical infrastructure. With regard to access to the internet, there's also the poor digital literacy and skills, because you find that many of the MSMEs and the smaller businesses, the moms and pops, they really, I would not say have a lack of appetite, but the lack of digital literacy skills that creates a, a barrier, it really is. And it's something that I will address later on um, in this discussion the lack of access to afford financial infrastructural expansion, as well as adequate cybersecurity, or enforcement of consumer protection regulations. And when it comes to complex cross-border trade and administrative procedures, as Mala had touched on and gone into in great depth, the fact of the matter is that within the regions and within the Caribbean, I must commend um, the OECS for launching the Dcash, but within other jurisdictions, you find that there may be mobile wallets or digital solutions, digital currency solutions, but they're based to that specific country. And they may not necessarily allow you to do cross-border trade within the region itself or even internationally. And they're in looking at how we can approach the continuous integration as a region and benefiting the region, it is incumbent on us to look at what would be an excellent or ideal regional solution. So in terms of digital financial inclusion, I, I think I've touched on this already, but you find that 2 billion individuals and 2 million, 200 million small businesses lack access to formal savings and credits. And this gap really can be filled by access to the use of digital currencies and digital financial solutions that allow them to now become part of that integrated economy. And while there is that degree of mistrust that comes, for example, in relation to cryptocurrencies and their risks, and even with regard to certain um, digital currencies, the fact of the matter is that you have to embrace both the good and bad, because with greater financial inclusion, comes the ability to access finance. With the digitalization of your trade flow, it is easier to conduct credit checks and also undertake customer due diligence. So it's, it's really like some, a cyclical effect. Once you become involved in part of that digital economy, the continuous benefits redound. And digital cash solutions, it's not just about cryptocurrencies or CBDCs, but we're looking at it from mobile financial services and even peer-to-peer -peer financial payments that have worked and, and do work very well. So I would be very remiss if I did not think and point out that one of the greatest areas and important that we can look at in the Caribbean, and that's why this initiative by the CTU is highly laudable, is that it is essential if we're to move any further to build a strong and robust base for digital skills and financial literacy. Because it is the only way in which we not only allow people to overcome their fears, but also allow for greater financial inclusion by those who actually need these solutions the most. It allows you to develop a digital economy ready workforce. And while people have a mistrust that these traditional, non-traditional solutions will replace their way of life. It actually allows for retooling and reskilling because you find that with the creation of these new financial sectors and financial solutions, it also requires a digital ready workforce that are able to 
provide the basis of skills and expertise to run this. Promote social awareness among customers and the general population. And you know, it's one thing that, that is absolutely integral when it comes to financial literacy. Building that trust and confidence to not only go online, but also identifying what would be your avenues for redress. A lot of people, and when it comes to looking at the economic risks and challenges, they have grave reservations when it comes to what is our customer protection and customer redress facilities, and even dispute resolution facilities. When it is I go online, or when it is I do use digital currencies, or even cryptocurrency solutions, where can I go to when it is that my transaction goes awfully wrong? And it's, it's very important that we also consider that in using this, there is a triple and there, there is a trickle effect in building on or in, in introducing other ancillary sectors or ancillary businesses that are built upon these solutions. For example, use of open data applications. So some of our challenges that we would have identified before and Charmaine very rightly put it forward. We do have great solutions, but technology generally is, it's always a front runner with legislation following very slowly behind. Even in advanced economies such as Estonia and Singapore, you'd find that it is very rare for the legislation to lead the way and then technology follows. One of the things, however, that is absolutely critical is that you acknowledge that this is a fact. The process of lawmaking takes very long. And even though you have exceptional policy advisors, the best thing that can you cannot possibly legislate for everything. And it is something that is not only particular to the Caribbean, but we have seen it in many other regions, for example, the Pacific and Asia. Lack of trust is a critical barrier to the uptake of e-commerce payments. And updating that legislation and regulations can build online customer trust. But in building out your legislation, it is important to do so in a holistic manner. You will find that many times when you look at the legislation that you would need to address in order to very successfully launch and integrate digital currencies within your own jurisdictions involves looking at payment systems regulation, digital assets, cybercrime, data protection, cross-border data flows, competition, consumer protection, electronic transactions, taxation, and the list goes on. Because they're all parts of what needs to be addressed. But you find that a lot of countries do it in a very piecemeal fashion. As a result of which you'd find a recent trend that we've been seeing within the Caribbean is for jurisdictions that are interested in putting forward and advancing digital currencies is to create a holistic digital assets or digital currencies bill that addresses all of these issues instead of having to try to interpret and address it in a piecemeal fashion. The other thing that is absolutely necessary, however, when you do put in place this wonderful legislation, it is essential to ensure that concurrently you have an implementation plan that is taking place. So when your legislation and your regulations finally hit the books, you are ready to proceed and do so in a progressive fashion. So, so, so sorry, forgive me for interrupting Vashti. Uh, I have to be mindful uh, of the time. We're, we're being swamped by questions from um, <laughs> attendees. Um, so, but uh, if you can, Right, I'm just going to skip over public private sector cooperation because I know that this has been addressed and I'm going to go straight on to what are our recommendations. Greenfield opportunities are there and I think every single speaker has pointed out that the Caribbean as a whole is the opportunities are rife and you have great interest among businesses and consumers. But it is important to ensure that in so doing in the development of these solutions that we use fact-based research and customized domestic solutions. 
Because at the end of the day, what you want is to proactively develop something that can allow for greater regional integration. It is therefore necessary to ensure that it is tailored to each country's socioeconomic needs. There is no one size fits all. And while something may work great in the Bahamas, it may be a different case in Haiti, Jamaica, or Trinidad. I cannot underscore enough that while the business sector and technocrats and policymakers understand the importance of cryptocurrencies and digital currencies, it is necessary to have that political will and also political agreements by leaders within the Caribbean. There's essential, it is essential to undertake a holistic approach and most importantly, please promote sensitization and trust building to make sure that when you do have viable solutions, you're capable of taking them to market and have full adoption within your economies. On that note, I'd stop because as Amit had indicated, we have a lot of questions. Thank you, Vasha, and my, my sincere apologies. I, I hope that this presentation will also be available on the CTU's website along with Ian's uh, presentation. We do have one. Uh, this is pretty much the interactive Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, we're gonna have to keep it extremely tight and succinct. We do have a question um, from the media um, I'm just getting to it here, just bear with me. This, this may be, um, Jan, you may want to take a stab at this. Um, we have a question from the media, uh, media representative, what cost do we foresee for individuals and businesses in terms of changes that will be required to facilitate proposed digital payments such as Karen Coin for argument's sake? Um, and what plan do you think, and maybe the other panelists can weigh in on this, would be required to bring awareness and change the mindset, as as Vashti said, you know, culture and, and and change management is a key thing. Um, but but Jan, over to you. What, what do you foresee uh, cost wise? You know, will it be expensive? Will the switching costs be expensive for me as an individual or a business to to move over to things like Carib coin or Dcash or what have you? The goal naturally is to bring the costs down. So we still have to set up the business plan. We're just in the phase of setting up a product and doing product market fit at the moment, but we want to get it clearly down at the moment. We have a mean of something like 7% uh, costs for regional trade. Um, and we surely want to have it just to say, this is the goal we're following. The other thing I'd like to say there, because we have a public private governance, we will certainly have to talk about some kind of social part of costing as well, if we want to enforce broader usage of it. And yes, we have a plan. We start with businesses, maybe of interest in Switzerland since 1934, there's a parallel currency used only by businesses and it's clear advantage for their development of GDP. Some very interesting thing to look at. And that's why we say we focus on this to really bring the economy forward. And then from there, maybe have a trickle down effect through salaries being paid in pair of dollar or whatever. We think this is more viable than the swapping facility between all the currencies in the Caribbean, because this is a very complicated bureaucratic thing. Pair of dollar is rather a way straightforward, which may be integrated to other uh, attempts in the future. Okay. Perfect. Um, we have a specific question for uh, Marla. Um, how does the digital system play into the current financial system where a user goes fully digital, but a bank wants to check um, your credit history? What credibility and considerations will be given to a client's application for a loan as it relates to fluctuations in the, in the digital market? Uh, and Marla, just being cognizant of, of time, if we can keep it... Um, Short and sweet, as they say. So that question yeah, is... Uh, that question, I think, assumes that we're using and integrating digital currencies as opposed to CBDCs, which that's not what we are discussing and that's not what is on the cards or is happening now. And as to the credit um, adjudication process, I think that's dependent on the institution. I can't speak to that. Sorry. Okay, no problem. So, so not quite the same thing um that that we're talking about two slightly different um concepts very different concepts okay no problem um 
this is an actually an interesting one and and, and um Marlon or, or Vashti, this one speaks, we, we spoke about culture and change, and, and I'm also being mindful of my own time. This interesting question here, how does a cultural system called the Susu or, or partner or Padna in Jamaican or Sol in Haiti, how does this fit in into, into, into our new digital environment and, and way of doing things? Because these Susus, uh, and we have them in Barbados, I believe they're called meeting turns, this is where the unbanked currently participate in, in a major way. Well, at the end of the day, you know, Susu's, I think, and it's very funny, I'm going, I'm mindful of time, but it's part of our informal financial savings system. Every village, if you worked in a government, everybody gives $2 and you have a rotating hand and it, it helps out when you have to buy school books and, and, and things like that. But the, the role of digital wallets is that it allows you, to, you can use solutions. The fact of the matter is the technology is there. Even like when I recently attended a workshop in Trinidad, I looked up and there was NCash. You find that banks and other financial providers are providing services that allow for this small man to be able to access financial services. And the thing about it is that it's something that these small saving schemes can benefit from because it allows for greater transparency, greater accountability. But you have a direct guarantee that when it is your turn to cash out on, on pool savings, that it's a solution that is viable to you. But there must be that willingness to move out of your traditional context where you know and trust the person you're dealing with to pool savings to now deal with a technical solution that will allow you to do that. So, so we may very well see digital susus uh, and meeting turns, as it were. Well, you know, the, the, the solution in Haiti, the, the digital um, financial wallet, is called Moncash. In fact, it has a lot of nicknames. And even when you look at, at how a similar system is used in like Kenya, for instance, with M-Pesa and other type solutions, it's really aimed at the small person who really will have the money under their mattress but cannot access a bank, but need to be able to make payments. So I think we can look forward to seeing similar tailored solutions coming more so onto the Caribbean scene. Okay. Um, Charmaine, interesting enough with Dcash, um, I mean, being right here, so to speak, in the heart of the Caribbean, I mean, I know we have the Bahamas, but this is more closer to us, so to speak. What what are your thoughts on on this you know this this space digital cash, uh, CBDCs, you know we we've seen some concerns about privacies and monitoring of CBDCs. How has how has adoption and usage been for the Eastern Caribbean um, Central Bank? So I, it's been mixed. Um, I think we have a long way to go still. I think persons are still very skeptical. Part of it has to do with the whole privacy, as you, as you said. Um, until the person wants to know who will see my transactions, who will know what I'm doing, because they compare Dcash to physical cash. And we do know that with physical cash, there is full anonymity. What we what we um, we say to the public is, is control anonymity, Dcash, in the sense that for persons who onboard by, via their financial institutions, it's the same relationship you have with your financial institution currently, where your transactions are only known to your financial institution. And so... Um, that issue of privacy has been a concern that we've had to um, speak about in our public education campaign. And then you look at things like um, the whole cybersecurity. Persons are concerned about the whole cybersecurity with all the cybersecurity incidents that have been happening. That's another concern that persons have. So it's a big, it's a big push for public education in terms of getting the buy-in. From the financial institution's perspective, we have the whole issue of um, competition because they see Dcash as a competitor to their, their financial products that they're offering. However, so we have to look at what's the value proposition for these financial institutions, increase efficiencies. Um, they can actually build additional financial services from our Dcash platform. So I think um, it's, it's becoming more and more of a, of a thing, so, um, for want of a better word, in terms of the COVID-19 environment in particular, when persons are now moving more towards digital solutions and they have the comfort of knowing that the Dcash is their central bank digital currency. So that means of itself gives an extra push for persons to be able to adopt, but there's still a long way to go in terms of persons being fully comfortable with both the, the digital space and moving from their physical cash to digital currency. 
well said, um, Charmin. Um, at this point, I would like to quickly um, announce the results of our second poll, which ironically we were talking about adoption. Um, we were asking attendees to, to kind of vote, so to speak, on the barriers to adoption um, based upon you know, four high level categories, political, education, social and technical. Uh, not too surprisingly, it seems that political uh, forces or factors seem to be the largest barrier to adoption coming in at 48 percent, followed by education. We spoke about that uh, via the panelists. Um, um, you, you folks have mentioned people not being comfortable or being accustomed or not being familiar. That comes down to the digital literacy. Um, is social um, barriers to adoption and, and again, not surprisingly, technical barriers to adoption coming in at 6 percent. So, so basically saying, look, these are not necessarily technological problems to, to cash and cryptocurrencies and, and CBDCs and, and stable coins, but more so political, educational and social. Uh, at this point in time, I'm being, I'm being very mindful of time. Uh, I would like to thank the, the panelists, um, Dr. Schroeder, Ms. Maharaj, Ms. Powell, Ms. Dukaran, Thank you so much for your time. I apologize. There's so many, there were so many more questions, but that just goes to show you how important and, uh, and critical this topic is within the region and, and why this seminar facilitated by the CTU has been so critical. On that note, I would like to hand back over to Secretary General Taylor to, to, to wrap up. Thanks so much, Amit. Excellent job. And um, we're out of time. And clearly, this has been a teaser. We have to see what we can do about round two. Uh, we want to thank Carrie Coyne and Abed Benches for the support uh, of this very engaging uh, webinar. We think it's been useful. Um, thank Jan Jan for his taxonomy on digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, which has been very, very useful. We have, of course, an all-star female panel Charmin Powell, Marla Dukran, Vashti Maharaj, thank you all very much uh, for supporting this, um, this webinar today. I mean, again, excellent job. We thank the regional media who participated, posed, posed their questions, the directors and staff of the CTU, and last but not least, our nearly 500 participants who joined us online. The recordings will be available, the presentations will be available, and we will be reaching out to you again in the future on this and other engaging topics. Thank you for joining us today. Recording.